So you want to be a software developer. You want to be a front end dev in 2025, but you don't know what it's like. In this video, we're going to cover exactly what a day in the life of a front end developer, what a day in the life of a software engineer looks like so that you can know whether or not this is even for you. Is it too hard? Is it too busy? Is it too complicated? So on and so forth. We're going to cover all these questions in this video today. Right now, I'm going to tell you exactly what it's like. If you don't know me, my name is Jake. I'm an ex Amazon engineer engineer and I'm making these videos for free so that I can share with you exactly what I did do, what I didn't do, what's what I'm actively doing to be a $100,000 front end developer that's working remotes in 2025, right? So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into the video. Now this video is going to have a few parts, all right? First three parts is going to be the coding, the actual work itself, the code reviews and the meetings, right? So these are kind of the three fundamentals of things you'll actually be doing. So the actual work itself, reviewing other people's work as well as what are you going to be meeting about how much you're going to be a meeting so on and so forth and then i'll talk about like what an average schedule might look like as an entry level as an intern level as a mid-level developer so that you can know you know whether or not this is for you coding all right and i can even add here in parentheses this is like this is your work and then code review this is reviewing others work we'll add that in a second here but what does your work actually look like okay as a front-end developer your work might look different than say a back-end developer your work's going to be different than the designers your work's going to be different than product managers so on and so forth so as a front-end developer what are you actually going to be doing the main function of your role you're going to be working very closely with a product manager and a designer mostly the the designer right you're going to take the designs that they've built right that they've drawn in figma usually and you're going to turn them into code right so you're going to turn them into a website into a web app that can actually be used by the users you know that the customers that you serve okay so cloning design that that means turning a figma into actual code beyond that so you're going to be working on integrating existing apis right so what does that mean your back-end developers and third-party developers they've built these systems to actually give you raw data right non-human readable code or non-human readable data and it's your job to integrate to plug into those existing solutions that give you the data and turn that into human readable components, human readable text, human readable uh, data function, you know, whatever it is that you're building, right? So an example of this might be Stripe, for example, as an API. So if your website sells products online, you need a way to process payments, right? So you'd have to build out a couple things. One, where does the user actually put in their card details? Okay, so you would be building that form or you would be building the design around that form. Okay, so that would be an example of cloning a design. Now, let's say the user clicks checkout. They've, they put in their card details and then they click checkout. What actually happens when that button is clicked? Okay, well, your company, odds are your company doesn't process the payment yourself, right? Because it's very complicated. There's all kind of complexity there. So you use a third party to help you process payment. One of those third parties is Stripe. So you might use Stripe's API to help you process those payments. So being able to hook into existing APIs, other people's APIs as well as your own team's backend developers' APIs. You're gonna need to do that, right? That's gonna be part of your work, okay? So that's an example of a function you might be doing as a front-end developer. Another is making a design mobile responsive, right? So it's one thing, like for example, right now we're looking at a desktop computer, right? It's widescreen, so on and so forth. This is on my laptop right now, but for intents and purposes, it is a desktop viewport, okay? What happens if somebody views your website on mobile? What happens if somebody views your website on tablet, right? These different screen widths and sizes, things like that. When you're writing your code as a front-end developer, you have to be mindful of where people are going to be viewing your code. So, right, where people are going to be viewing your website. And so your design should be seamless across every single viewport so that it looks good everywhere. All right, so a part of your job is going to be making sure that uh, your work is mobile responsive as well as managing different state. Let's say, for example, going back to our payment processing example, right, our Stripe example, let's say somebody enters, you know, card details and the card details are just wrong or for whatever reason their, their card was rejected. Well, what actually do you display to the user? Okay. You know, when that bad state comes back or that error state comes back, how do you change the design in such a way that the user knows that their information was wrong or their card declined or, you know, what have you? How do you communicate that to them? All right. Now your designer is going to think through these things, right? And, and help you come up with, with good designs, but it's your job as a front-end developer to actually uh, build the thing, right? To understand what that error states come through and then to change the design in such a way that you're communicating to your user exactly what's happening. And then the last thing here is kind of just in general as a front-end developer, you're building a lot of times what's called reusable components. So I'm trying to think of an example here. I don't have my phone on me, but 
let's say this, this notebook right here, for example, all right, there's a few components of this notebook. One of them is the cover, this hard cover here, okay? That hard cover is going to be re reused in every single notebook that they make, okay? The cardboard within it, right? And this particular company, they make all kind of different uh, colors and things like that, but the cardboard within the hard cover of it, it doesn't change. It's reused over and over and over across several different types of notebooks, okay? So um, this is a like term, by the way, my favorite type of notebook. If you're looking for a notebook like term, by the way, I am not affiliated with them. I am not sponsored. I've just used them forever uh, and I love them. So think about in your work as a front-end developer, you're going to be thinking about how your component, how your work can be reused across several different designs and facets of your website. And if this sounds super abstract, you don't know what I'm talking about. No problem at all. You're not meant to uh, know this yet, but that is what you're actually going to be doing as a front-end developer. Now, the next part of this, what are you actually going to be doing is code review, okay? As an entry-level, as a mid-level uh, engineer as a mid-level front-end developer, you're not going to be doing too, too much of this, reviewing other people's code, but you should at least be looking at it, right? You're not going to be the one that makes the final call on other people's work a lot of the time. But the point of code review is to make sure that bad code doesn't make its way into production, okay? Uh, and so what that entails, and let me have this note. So you're reviewing others' work. And the point here is when you get more experienced, you start to pick up on issues and bad patterns and bad habits and inefficiencies of other people's code. And your job is to prevent them. Your, your job is to make sure that your team is shipping the highest quality code without issues uh, consistently, systematically, programmatically, whatever. Um, and that's, that's what code review is for, okay? And so in a engineer, in a developer environment, like you're going to be writing code and your teammates are going to be writing code. And before that code reaches production, before that code is actually sent off to customers, you review each other's work to make sure there's no glaring issues. Um, and so that's the point of code review. So part of your time, part of your day as a software developer, as a front-end developer is going to be code review, ensuring other people's code works, ensuring they're not making egregious mistakes, ensuring that their code is efficient and dry if possible, right? What does dry mean? It is a coding principle that means do not repeat yourself. And that goes back to our early example of making reusable components. If somebody's like rebuilding the wheel from scratch, this is where you would step in and be like, no, you know, you don't need to use that. You don't need to do that again. Like we've already built this over here. Just go ahead and reuse that. Plug that into your work. In that way, like it does a bunch for you. I'm, it's too much to talk about in this video because we'll go on a, on a long tangent about dry, but part of your day is going to be this code review. So moving on, when are you actually going to be in meetings? And I'll tell you, the thing I love about engineering, the thing I love about being a front-end developer is you don't spend that much time in meetings. Me personally, I despise meetings if they're not useful, okay? I would much prefer to hide away in my little hole, to work on my code, to just build, 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 build. That's what I enjoy, okay? That's what I enjoy. And that's because, you know, I was, I was raised somewhat only child that I was, I'm just used to this, right? I, I grinded video games as a kid and, and this is kind of like its own video game. So as an engineer, you're going to spend a lot of time alone, uh, working, tinkering on your code. Uh, and if that's not you, if you don't enjoy this, to be quite honest, this career might not be for you, all right? Because you spend a lot of time as an individual contributor, looking at your own work in your own minds, you know, kind of isolated in some ways. No, it doesn't have to be. There's, there's certainly more social engineers and others that like to talk to other people that like to get involved and so on and so forth. And eventually you can be an engineering manager where you sit in meetings all day or, you know, whatever, or you can be a product manager. It's also sit in meetings all day where you're constantly talking to people. But as a strictly entry-level, mid-level engineer, you're not going to talk to people that much. You're not going to be in meetings that much. And so currently right now, I don't spend more than one to two hours a day, uh, usually an hour or less a day in meetings, right? And I call myself a mid-level engineer right now. Not senior, I haven't been doing this forever, but I am mid-level and I've, I've seen the first few ranks of engineering and what it's like. And in my experience, I've not spent more than an hour or two a day in meetings. And this is for the best, right? As an entry and mid-level, your job is to ship code, as much quality code as you can, right? You are a machine. You are meant to produce value you're meant to produce work right and and the only way to well not the only way but the main way that you accomplish that is through actually writing code okay uh, but the meetings that you do have there's a few that tend to pop up over and over um the first is stand up you will have stand up every day the point of stand up is or well, you usually you'll have stand up every day i've worked at a place that we only did a few times a week but the point of stand up is basically to say what did you work on yesterday what are you working on today do you have any blockers anything that's stopping you from, from making progress on your work? Uh, and then do you have any issues? Do you have any other things you want to talk about uh, as a team? So stand up is with your direct engineering team. So it's usually no more than, I don't know, five to eight people in there. Uh, and it's mostly all engineers and your tech lead, maybe a PM in there. 
but it's meant to be hyper isolated to talk about the work itself, the technical work itself. And it gives you a pulse on where you're at. It gives you a pulse on where your teammates are at, where your team team is at as a whole. And this is kind of just your time to catch up with your team. If you work remote, you're not going to see these people every day. And and like this, this is your opportunity to actually see and connect with your team. If you work remote, is that stand up, right? You're going to see them every single day. So that is the main meeting that you'll have. The next type of meeting that you'll have is a design handoff or a kickoff, right? So if your designer finishes a Figma and they want to walk through it with you, you might have what's called a design handoff meeting. What they're going to do on this meeting is they're going to show you the design you've built. And this is your opportunity to ask questions, to poke holes in their designs, to ask edge cases, things like that, considerations, trade-offs, whatever. Um, it's your job to consider the things that designer did not consider in this meeting, okay? And to fully understand their intention with what they've built. Because the reality is sometimes it can be very hard to communicate in a design what a design is supposed to do in random states that you'll only experience because you code, right? It's, it's very difficult to think through all the cases and states as a designer, just because like, you're not the one actually writing the code. You don't know what it looks like from that side necessarily, right? Some designers do, but usually, you know, it's very hard to think through all potential cases. Okay. But that's what this meeting is. Usually these are pretty infrequent, but if they finish a new design and they want to talk through it with you, that's what that will be. The next type of meeting that you'll have is a retro. Okay. So as an engineer, you operate in sprints a lot of time, one to two weeks, right? Which means that you get your set of work for a week or two, right? And you make progress on that work and you work, 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 work. And then at the end of that one week or two week block, you have what's called a retro. What went well during those one week, during that one week? What went well during those two weeks? What needs improvements? Any other things we should talk about? And this is how your team reflects on the past work block. And this is how you get better as a team. This is where you spot inefficiencies. This is where you spot opportunities for improvements uh, as a team so that you can move with a greater velocity in the future. Okay, so this is what's called a sprint retro. Uh, and you'll have these about once a week, if not once every two weeks or so. And those are pretty common. But again, you will not have those every day. You'll have stand up every day. You'll have a design kickoff or handoff maybe once every couple weeks, once every few weeks, once a sprint. I don't know. These are not that common either, but uh, they do have them periodically. The main one is stand up though. The next type of meeting that you'll have is a bug bash. Uh, so what is a bug bash? It's basically when your team has shipped a big feature or your engineering org has shipped a big feature, because we're human, we make mistakes, there's going to be issues with it. The goal of a bug bash is to find the issue, the existing usability issues with your code uh, so that you can patch them up before it's released to customers. Okay, so in these type of meetings, you as well as others, even non-technical people will be in these meetings testing the work, making sure that it's legit, making sure that it doesn't have issues, uh, identifying all the issues that it has so that you can go and fix them. Okay. So again, bug bashes, they don't happen that frequently. They are not every day. Uh, it's really when you complete a big block of work and you're almost ready to get it to consumers, but um, the code needs to be tested first. Okay. So that's what a bug bash is. The next type of meeting you'll have is an all hands. So depending on the size of your company, you may have all hands every week. You may have all hands every two weeks or what have you, or it may just be in your org, right? If you're at Amazon or, you know, some other big company, they might not even do all hands, right? It's barring once a quarter, once a year or something like that, right? Because it's very expensive to bring all your employees together at one time. Uh, but if you're at a smaller company, if you're at a startup, you'll odds are you'll have these pretty frequently so that the company can stay in line so that the company's all on the same page about what they're building, what they're trying to accomplish, so on and so forth, right? So I would say these happen at most once a week. Uh, at least once every few weeks, every month or so. I don't know. In my experience, it's either been, been once a week or once every two weeks. So all hands is just a meeting that you don't really participate in other than ask questions, if not just listen in and, and understand what's going on. So the main meeting you'll have as an engineer is a stand up. Okay. Most of your time is given back to you. What does an average schedule actually look like? The actual meat of this video, it's like, what are you actually going to be doing day to day? Let's let's map it out into actual times, what that might look like for you. So let's let's assume you just work a standard nine to five. Um, you're working eight hours a day. Uh, what does that look like? So me personally, when I get in, I like to block off the morning. I have the clearest minds. I like I do my best work in the morning. I don't want to talk to anybody because it's distracting, right? I want to get in and actually write my code and make progress on my work. Okay, so I'm going to block out the first couple hours and I'm just going to write code. Following that uh, is going to be some code review of others' work, right? So odds are your teammates will have raised what's called a PR, a pull request, and they need somebody to review it so that they can merge it, okay? And so a lot of times I'll have a code review or two that have been piled up, that have been in the queue, 
that I'll go ahead and take a look at now. And I try to knock them all out in one blog so that I'm not co constantly context switching. Okay, so I'll spend 30 minutes, I'll spend an hour reviewing their code, uh, making sure it's good, making sure it's, you know, quality so that we can get that merged. And that's kind of my next block of work. After that, I may have a stand up meeting. Okay, so a stand up's typically, you know, 15 to 30 minutes long. So I meet with my team, tell them what I'm working on. How's it going? What's next? You know, what did I do yesterday? Any blockers, any other questions, things to call out, things like that. So I, I'm going to put 30 minutes here. And um, that's every day, pretty much. And then after that, you know, I'll take 30 minutes, I'll take 45 minutes, I'll take an hour for lunch. This is not hard. Sometimes I take a full hour. Sometimes I don't take lunch at all. I eat at my desk and I, ju I just keep working. So this really varies and it, it kind of depends on, you know, are you pressed against the deadline? Are you really trying to hit a goal? Are you in a more chill environment? It really depends, right? I'd say on average, though, I usually don't need to skip lunch. I, I can usually take my time, enjoy my lunch, go outside, get some fresh air, so on and so forth, work outside things like that. Uh, but lunch so usually part of my day. So include that there. And then, you know, I'm gonna get back to coding, right? I get back, I'm gonna open up the laptop and I'm gonna get back to work, do an hour, hour and a half of progress on my own work there. And um, once I made some good progress, maybe I raise a pull request, things like that. Uh, and I'm ready to move to the next thing. Or if I get stuck, or I need to think, I'm gonna go take a walk or a break. I hesitate to call it a break. Because a lot of times people look at engineers or whatever and be like, Oh, you know, they don't work that hard. You know, they're, they're walking around, they're not really grinding things like that. But like, the reality is the work itself can be challenging. And your brain can only think through so many problems at a time. And like, what do I mean like this? Like when you're presented with an engineering problem, you don't always have the solution right away. Sometimes it takes time and you have to think about how you're going to solve a problem. You have to consider different trade-offs. You have to consider how this problem might look like if it were solved. And sometimes taking a walk or taking a quote unquote break can give you that mental bandwidth, can give you that space in your brain to actually think through what it is you're trying to do. And so I only included this once in this page today, but I think in reality, I take a few walks a day uh, because it really helps me think. It actually makes me better in my work. So while I'm not actively quote unquote coding, I am thinking about problems. I am thinking about like how I'm gonna build things, how I'm gonna solve different problems in my work. So I'm gonna include that there for posterity. And I get back, maybe review some code. Straightforward, what we talked about earlier, you know, you're just helping out teammates, making sure your team speed is up. And then last part of my day, I'll spend coding. If I am around teammates, you know, I may last part of the day, maybe more chill, maybe talking to them, preparing for tomorrow. I kind of hold this as just like an open period where it could be anything. It could be more code review. It could be other meetings. It could be writing your own code. It could be preparing your work for tomorrow. What are you actually going to work on tomorrow? How are you going to work on it? What problems do you need to solve? What's outstanding? Things like that. But that's pretty much my average schedule. In this particular schedule, I only inclu included one meeting. On average, I think I only have stand up every day. Sometimes I have another meeting, things like that. But uh, that's only 30 minutes of meetings. That's not to say every day is like that. But I would say this is like an average day as a front end developer. And one thing I'll call out here is a lot of this time is spent alone. Look, look, two hours alone, hour and a half alone, another maybe another hour and a half alone. So that's like what? That's five hours? right there, you might you might spend five hours not talking to anybody, right? If you were super extroverted, and you get energy from talking to other people and like being isolated and working on your own is very unenergizing, or like demotivating, I would ask yourself if this is really for you, because you will spend a lot of time in your own head thinking, working silently alone, things like that. But if this fires you up, if you were always kind of more introverted, or you would like to play video games, and just grind behind your computer, right? This is what the schedule looks like. And if you don't want to talk to anybody like you don't even, in this career, you don't really have to talk to others, right? You are judged on the merit of your work in that, you know, if you produce great code, review others great code, right? You really don't have to interact with others that much. And, th and that can be a blessing and a curse for many reasons. Um, but you have to ultimately decide if that's for you. So anyways, that was a video that talks about what work you'll actually be doing, how you'll be reviewing other work, the meetings you'll be in and what an average day looks like. Um, so again, my name is Jake, I appreciate you watching this video. Now, if you are looking to break into this industry, or you want to take the next step, I've included a free training for you at this website right here, frontendfuture.com. There's also a link in the description. Go ahead and watch that free training. It's going to give you a lot of clarity on what to actually do to break into this industry. Okay. If you want to go about it faster, you can even book in some time with me. You can book in a call with me and we can discuss how we can get you into this industry even faster. Again, so my name was Jake. I appreciate you watching this video and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.